Okay, I think we are live. Um, and I hope we have a lot of people. And I can see people are joining, which is great. Um, so thanks so much for dialing in to our webinar. Um, I'm honored to be your host today. My name is Raphael um, Guller. I'm one of the co-founders at Sweep. And yeah, we're very excited to be talking to you today about um, how you can manage your finance emissions in your climate action networks. Um, and so we have really good um, guest speakers lined up. Um, before we jump in, maybe just one um, quick word about Sweep and about myself. Um, so I have a background in, in business design and psychology, actually. And you know, somehow Sweep was the perfect way to bring all this together and use it for the cause of our generation, um, climate change, of course. Right? And so we're a mission-driven company um, with the aim to help the economy decarbonize. And there's sort of two main insights um, that Sweep is based on, right? One is that carbon is a data and a network problem, right? So all the business data, how do you turn it into emissions? How do you understand it and how do you manage it? And then how do you do it across your networks? Because one company alone can't really reduce their footprint, right? You need to work with your partners. Um, and the second insight is we really believe that carbon can be a creative force, right? I think there's a lot of you know, it's a lot about risk management and sort of the scares of climate change. That's all true. And that's an important driver. But we also think that carbon can help you create strong business models that will allow you to be prosperous in a decarbonized future. And so that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, we will show you how to drive collaboration across your investment portfolio. So across those networks, right? we will talk about how to comply with disclosure mechanisms to instigate change. And finally, how to use carbon and ESG data to identify risks and those opportunities. Um, we have two speakers today. So we're very happy that we have Sharon Tarasca from CDP, um, who will start off. And then we have uh, Marianne Vincent from Sweep. She's our VP of climate finance and an expert in everything finance emissions and data around that. And then finally, we'll have um, plenty of time for Q&A. So we'll gather your questions. Please put them into the Q&A. Um, you know, you've got that button down here, so put it in there. We will um, gather all these answers and I will pass them on to our speakers later. And I think that's it for housekeeping. So thanks so much for joining. Um, and I'll hand over to Nayan. I think it's to Jérôme first. Yes. Thank you. Hello, Raphael. Yes, uh, thank you for hosting me. So, a quick word about the NGO CDP. Um, so, as most of you uh, in in the webinar today would uh, probably know, CDP is an environmental NGO that works at um, getting uh, more. I would say more data, more transparency from uh, from companies, and um, and is pushing for. Uh, an economy that works for the people and the planet. And uh, the way for CDP to achieve its mission is to drive transparency through companies, but also cities and regions. And um, we've been doing this for uh, 23 years uh, today. Um, and so over the years, CDP has created a very, uh, if not the, the, the biggest self-reported corporate environmental database in the world. So companies reporting their data to CDP. And the reason they do it is because we are supported by uh, various stakeholders. Um, and um, uh, one of our big network of stakeholders uh, are investors and financial institutions who are mandating CDP to collect data on their behalf. And so today we'll talk a lot about data, like Rafael said, and um, and that's where we will uh, we'll bring our, our expertise. Thank you for receiving me. Yes, and a, a few words about SWIP. Um, so SWIP is a SaaS platform that helps uh, corporates and financial institutions to pilot their climate and sustainable journey. SWIP was founded in 2020 by three co-founders, like you, you met Raphael just before. Uh, the founders are coming from the business intelligence and data analytics backgrounds. So that makes SWIP uh, one of the strongest platforms on the market uh, in terms of uh, data infrastructure and data security. But beyond being a, a climate tech, we have a team of carbon experts, carbon experts to make sure that all the carbon footprints calculated on the platforms comply with the highest market standards like the GIG protocol, PSBTI targets, or the PICA framework for finance emissions. We are also a big up company. Our objective is to reduce the emission across the globe 
um, and help our clients to decarbonize because we think that companies need to see carbon and ESG not as a limitation, but uh, as a creative force for innovation and positive growth. We are now almost 100 people in Europe and beyond. Uh, we've raised $100 million in funding and that will help us to, to grow and to have more impact uh, you know, globally. I think uh, now we can uh, jump in uh, in, the, in today's uh, discussion. So a few words about the context um, to uh, why, uh, why we're here and why we are talking about uh, finance emissions. Um, in 2015, during the COP21, uh, the Paris Agreement recommended for the first time uh, to align public and private financial flows uh, towards a low carbon economy. I think that's a key milestone because it was the first time that we recognized the role of finance in financing uh, the transition to a low carbon economy. So it's kind of key because based on that, there was a lot of new regulations, new reporting, new climate disclosure that arose from this, uh, from this agreement. However, however, in the latest IPCC report, I uh, know that was published last month, uh, scientists pointed uh, to financial sectors saying that, you know, they don't do enough. Uh, they say that uh, there's not enough funding uh, for renewable energy. And so far, uh, financial flows to fossil fuel remain higher than those needed for climate change. So we clearly need more and more fundings and more, uh, you know, uh, Final soul uh, flows towards uh, a low carbon economy, and the scientists estimate that climate finance we need to increase between three to six times when 2030 to achieve mitigation goals. So when you hear like the CEO of BlackRock uh, saying uh, it's not our place to to tell companies what to do, well, actuality it kind of is uh, because with great power comes great responsibilities. Uh, when you see that the asset under management of a company like BlackRock is like three times bigger than the GDP of France, there's clearly uh, a lot of power and a lot of money that will help uh, the transition to a low carbon economy. So that comes to, uh, to the next slide. Huh? We, uh, we at SWIP and I think uh, Jérôme will agree that uh, we really believe that private equity has a big role to play uh, to accelerate the decarbonation and more globally the private market. Uh, because of the capacity to invest, uh, the private equity industry is more like six trillions of dollars in asset under management. This will increase to 11 trillions in 2026. This is massive. It's way more than what we need to finance uh, climate change. So clearly uh, they've got the capacity to invest. And when you see that, you know, uh, compared to listed markets, private equity offer on a longer time of uh, investment horizon. And you, you put that in, uh, you know, in parallel with uh, the accelerating consequences of climate change. You can see that when you invest in a company and you want to exit in five to seven years, uh, climate risk and financial risk are more and more uh, the same uh, type of, uh, of risk. And you clearly need to uh, assess that in your, in your diligence. Second, they've got the capacity to support innovation. Again, uh, to achieve net zero by 2030, we need a lot of new solutions, uh, new business model, new company. Uh, and even if you're not completely uh, techno uh, addict and you don't believe that everything, uh, the technology only we will solve uh, the, the transition, clearly there's like new concepts, uh, carbon re removal uh, solution, for example. We clearly need innovation. And this innovation will come uh, from new startups, new companies, and this will come from funding uh, from private equity. And then the fact capacity to transform. Uh, private equity can play a crucial engagement role in getting private companies to start their climate journey, to start reporting and managing their emissions because of their ownership, because of the governance. They've got some influence on the portfolio company. So clearly, uh, we, uh, we think that uh, private market uh, should take the lead on sustainability and, you know, fill the gap compared to what it's already uh, been done uh, on this uh, market. We know it's not easy uh, because uh, there's a lot of challenges and pressures coming from everywhere. Uh, there's a growing number of regulations uh, demanding uh, increased uh, transparency and granularity of data to report. Uh, there's a lot of pressure from LPs and employees uh, wanted uh, sustainability to be further integrated into investment decisions. So there's a lot of challenges between uh, what's available and what is demanded. Uh, and when we know that, you know, uh, most of the emissions uh, of uh, financial institutions are coming from the investment portfolio and the underlying assets, 
And these assets and these companies don't report correctly or on the full value chain scope one to one three. It's very difficult, you know, to calculate these famous finance emissions and, you know, to, to manage them and reduce them. So on this big number on how financial institutions to, to work on this perimeter of the famous cap free, I will uh, hand over to, uh, to Jerome. Yeah, thanks, Marianne. And just to build on what you just said about the importance of finance emission, um, uh, at CDP, we are collecting data on companies, including on financial institutions who report uh, to CDP via a financial service questionnaire. And in 2021, we launched the first report of its kind analyzing um, what companies uh, in the financial sectors are reporting. Um, and uh, we could assess in a report that is called Time to Green Finance, uh, that uh, in average, a financial institution has um, a scope three about 700 times bigger than its scope one and two combined, which makes sense. Obviously, um, as a financial institution, you may have a big energy bill um, and, and carbon emissions associated, but that's uh, a small, uh, I would say, a small impact uh, in comparison to uh, the, the emissions finance. So, um, when we talk about this, then of course there's a course of action that, that the NGO is encouraging uh, financial institutions to do that you are probably already aware of, uh, like of course adapting your investment decision process and, and try to finance companies that are the better prepared to face the challenges of uh, of climate change, but also uh, other issues related to biodiversity. So uh, adapting your investment decision is one thing report your emission, be transparent, and obviously uh, most of you uh, in the room or, or many of you in the room uh, will uh, are already facing the SFDR, and so you probably have to already uh, do a report uh, transparently on your finance emissions and other impacts in your portfolios. And then your responsibility is also, of course, to maybe work with the companies you finance, influence them to reduce their impact, fight greenwashing and, and keep them accountable for their commitments. We hear a lot of net zero out there. Um, maybe uh, set your own target, make your own commitments. Uh, we've seen actually uh, more and more private equity funds in the world setting a science-based target, which is very encouraging, uh, which means that they will uh, push companies inside their portfolios to reduce emissions in line with uh, 1.5 degrees. Um, but then, of course, um, going beyond climate, looking at biodiversity, climate is also a big biodiversity uh, loss driver. So working on climate is also uh, reducing uh, the risk of, um, you know, impacting uh, biodiversity even more as it is today. And that is very important, as we saw recently. Um, and finally, obviously, comply with the local regulation is also what's expected. And I mentioned that and as well as Marianne. Um, so in, in the next slide, it's just um, a quick recap of what actions you can take and, and what are your levers as a financial institution or as a private equity fund. Um, you can invest in grid solutions, so be what we could say a pure player or finance pure players uh, that um, provide solutions to uh, for, for the energy transition, for example, to reduce impact, for capture storage. So this is very important for the transition. It is nonetheless, um, I would say, uh, not so diversified and it might not suffice to get the high emitting sectors to transition. So um, accompanying uh, via the second pillar, which is engagement, accompanying companies that may be exposed today to high emitting sectors is very important. So um, working with, uh, you know, we will need steel, we will need cement in, in the coming years, we will need energy. And so what's important is that these sectors transition, reduce their emission. And as an investor, you can work with your companies inside your portfolio to reduce uh, to reduce that. And what if companies do not change, do not actually deliver on the promises or do not move as fast as you wish them to be? Then, of course, the third pillar is divestment or reallocation. But as you can see on the little chart of the right, um, that might not help reduce emissions in the real world. So I think this chart is, is showing that you could have a portfolio that is two degree aligned by, um, you know, shifting your assets and reallocating them but that will actually not change the emissions in the real world. So that's why at CDP, and I believe as well at SWIP, the, the second pillar, the engagement pillar, is, is a key pillar to transform um, the, the real economy. 
It's about getting companies that emit to reduce emission. And that's, that's an important part. And, and the, the, the dialogue and the influence you may have as an investor um, is a powerful tool to achieve that. And one of the things to achieve that and, and to activate that, that lever is the data and making sure that um, your engagement is informed by good quality data so that you can have, have a, a, an informed dialogue and raise the ambition of your companies, of the companies you invest. In. So yeah, climate is a data network issue. Clearly, uh, to take action, you need to know where to stand first. Um, maybe Carlos, if you can click again. So yeah, data is key to tackle finance emission because clearly this famous cap free or like the final the, the emissions of your underlying assets are outside of your reach. So how to collect this famous data? Because we know that today and for a long time, we were lacking data availability, data quality, data consistency, because sometimes we didn't have the same, you know, definition, the same perimeter. And it was very difficult to aggregate this data because it was not consistent. So doing this process on Excel, you know, when you have like 200 or 300 portfolio companies, it's clearly a nightmare. So when you do want to do it like more often and take actions and to pilot that to reduce, is becoming completely impossible. So that's why it was key to automate this data collection. And now we see like with the new regulations and with new frameworks, more and more we can see a convergence about how to assess uh, the carbon footprint for the portfolio companies, you know, with the GIG protocol, how to aggregate uh, these finance emissions with the PICA framework. And more and more, you know, for data beyond carbon with the ESG data, we know that, you know, you've got some regulations coming up already in place, like SFDR, but for, uh, you know, your European Union, but there's going to be a climate disclosure everywhere uh, uh, in the world. But clearly, you know, it's in place. 2023 will be like uh, the, the turning point. And you know, year on year, we will have more consistency to report this famous data. So now we need to automate and to make sure that we know we can collect the data with more transparency to make sure that everybody knows where to stand on the baseline. Because VISD is to spend less and less time on data collection and calculations and more time on the reduction. Yeah, so the clock is ticking for climate change. Uh, we heard that from the IPCC report. Huh? We know that uh, global warming will be by 1.5 degrees by 2030. So we need to work collaboratively on, you know, taking action. Uh, so that's key. And that's why we developed the platform SWIP to make sure that we can bring investors and investees together to start collaborate and reduce the emissions. Uh, we know that 95% of the emissions are coming from your investments. So of course, the only way to reduce is to do that together because you can set targets at your fund level, but you need to cascade these targets back to your portfolio companies to be able to reduce yourself. So the same before there was no like real framework, no guidance, no rules on how to do so. But now there's the new framework, you know, like the SBTI private equity, SBTI net zero, who give now some guidance on how to set a 1.5 trajectory at a fund level for private equity. And it's very, you know, interesting to see that what they propose is to create some engagement. So again, I think we will review that across the presentation, but how to engage with your portfolio companies, how to support them to start their climate journey, trying to collect and calculate this baseline and trying to support them in designing this trajectory on how to reduce. And what we will do is try to connect all these targets all together to make sure that we know we will all start uh, reducing collaboratively. Um, yeah, so that's why we developed sweep basically because we know that it was not easy uh, to just uh, limit uh, the data with estimates or to work on excel anymore especially if you wanted to spend more time on working on the reduction so the objective of sweep for finance was to have a very flexible tool to make sure that we address all the level of maturity within the portfolio to address all the level of data availability and to give you a lot of transparency 
uh, across your portfolio about how the emissions have been calculated and how you can trust all this data at your fund level. So the first step to cover 100% of your portfolio was to start with estimates. And that's why we've got this gold partnership with CDP huh, is to, uh, to use all the CDP work and CDP data to develop the sectoral benchmark to cover again all your portfolio and to kind of have uh, this you know snapshot of your uh, finance emissions but very quickly try to collect more granular data so that's the second step how to engage with your portfolio companies for free uh, by sending a questionnaire through the platform we will start to collect you know activity data scope one scope two scope three try to use what we do best doing calculating the carbon footprints because most of the startups and portfolio companies haven't started the climate journey they don't know you know they haven't never done uh, carbon footprints and estimates you know for you is not enough so how we try to engage them with a free account and make sure that you know they spend a few hours answering this survey and at the end they will get the first carbon footprints and uh, they can share this carbon footprint it will be their carbon footprint but at least they um like for you it's more accurate data but for them is the first step to uh, calculate their baseline the first step is for the more mature uh, portfolio company the one who wants to start reducing the one where you want them to have an sbti target so that you can have an sbti target also at the fund level is to embark them on the sweep platform also but to have all the functionalities simulate your impact simulates how to reduce follow and pilot an SBTI target and report internally and externally on the progress. And again, uh, as Raphael was saying at the very beginning, what we try to do is create this network effect, trying to make sure that thanks to the influence of the investor, they will start their climate journey, they will embark everyone into the reduction, and we will connect all the corporate accounts with the investor accounts, and we will all together pilot the reduction. We know that we talk a lot about carbon, but uh, there's also like a broader view about ESG hein, because the regulation is asking for more than carbon data. But also if you have a ESG strategy and you want to have some targets beyond carbon, I want to uh, achieve, uh, you know, more diversity across my portfolio. I want to achieve like, you know, to drive biodiversity uh, impact across my portfolio. You can also, um, you know, uh, pilot the strategy through the platform because the way we have to connect with the portfolio company in a very secure way is to collect and calculate the carbon footprint, but also to be able to collect all the indicators that will be uh, necessary for the regulations. So we've got a team of experts that will help you on the carbon footprint, but we are, have also uh, regulatory experts that we uh, that are, you know, designing all these uh, regulatory surveys and templates so that you can comply with, with the regulation. Concretely, at work, so it's just a few uh, screenshots because uh, that's not the purpose of today's uh, webinar to, to talk too much about sweep. But uh, clearly, as you can see, you will get a lot of transparency about the data quality uh, because that's the PICA framework and to explain how to allocate the finance emission, but also to give a quality score to make sure that at your level, you will know, you know, if you can trust or not this data or if you get, get more granular information and if you want to engage with the portfolio companies, you will uh, you, you can send all the surveys through the platforms and all the process management of you know collecting the data, validating the data, aggregating the data will be done through the platform. That's the first step because the second step will be to work on the reductions, and that's what on the second the next slide you will see like how you can track uh, and pilot your um, your SBTI targets. Carlos, if you can uh, move to the next slide, please. And I think that's one of the most advanced uh, reduction modules uh, on the market. Try to be able to um, calculate the impact. And for example, if you have a target at your fund level, you can cascade all these targets to your portfolio company. You can name all these initiatives by portfolio company. And for them, it will be, you know, easy to know uh, where to stand for their sector, for themselves, for their business model, and how to reduce and what will be the impact at your fund level and at the portfolio company level. The latest part, of course, is to communicate. Uh, so we've got regulatory templates, but it's also important to be able to communicate uh, internally 
uh, for you know your own climate strategy, but also we can design some dashboard per portfolio company so that you can help them to uh, to identify the hotspots and uh, reduction others. Very quickly, I think the next slide is some references for sweep. So as you see, we have uh, some uh, some. Uh, Private equity firms are already trust the street platform and work. We work with their portfolio companies as well. So you kind know, of see that, show that it's working, uh, trying to have uh, three different steps. All of them are using the three steps, like the estimates and how to connect with, uh, with some surveys. And for the ones who are, who wants to move forward, they will become uh, sweep customers. But yeah, the, the network effect starts to work. And, uh, you know, at, at the end, we will see that other initiatives already exist at, at TDP as well. Thanks, Marion. It looks like a, a very powerful tool and a good way for private equity funds to, to dig deep into their, their portfolios and have aggregated visualization, which is uh, very impressive. Um, what I'm going to Today is some work that CDP has been doing. As I um, as I introduced CDP earlier, I mentioned that um, the NGO has been collecting data for about 23 years. Um, and initially, we worked mainly on listed companies because that's where you know that's that these companies are concentrating the the negative impacts on on climate change. They are the one with the largest emissions. Um, and um, what we've noticed, obviously, is that um, despite working with supply chain in, in a supply chain program where we work with multinationals to collect data on their suppliers, um, we still realize that the, obviously, uh, although we uh, capture in terms of data a large share of the global public market capitalization, about 64% in 2022, which is huge. Um, in the private markets, uh, the uh, the share of of the capitalization that is reporting to CDP is very low. Well, that's the first problem that CDP wanted to tackle, and um, this private the supply chain program was not enough. Um, and furthermore, in, when we look at the next slide, uh, we realize that uh, not only uh, CDP is is only collecting data on a small portion of non listed companies. But also when non-listed companies report to CDP, um, as you can see, the, the, the red bar um, is much lower than the gray bar. So the gray bar is like publicly uh, listed companies. Um, they tend to report their emissions uh, in a much higher scale. So the, the, the percentage of, of firms being more transparent on the scope one and two and on the scope three is much higher. And that's that's a problem. Because obviously, uh, a, a large portion of the impact um, with thousands or millions of companies uh, is in non-listed uh, in the non-listed and private market sector. So that's the reason why uh, we've uh, worked on a new program, and that's what you can see on this slide. So the first line, the capital markets request, was how CDP got created. Um, getting support for uh, banks and investors and requesting listed companies to disclose to CDP or portion of listed company. Then the supply chain request was like, well, for some of these listed companies, they struggle to have scope three uh, data, it's particularly on the upstream. So we created in 2008 a supply chain request allowing big companies to ask their suppliers to respond to CDP. And we had a first exposure to private markets. And uh, two years ago, we've been designing, piloting, working on a new type of request that is called a private markets request, where private equity funds uh, can request their companies in, in their portfolio, their investee companies, to report to CDP as well. And uh, as you can see um, on the left, it's following the TCFD, so it's it's going uh, beyond, um, I would say, traditional metrics or mainstream metrics, and really try to get the, the companies through a journey of uh, of disclosure and transformation, not only on climate but also on uh, biodiversity topics such as uh, freshwater resources or exposition to uh, risk to deforestation. Um, and yeah, so we worked on this program with various uh, market participants, uh, some private equity funds, some some LPs, some GPs. 
we uh, we uh, also uh, work with uh, external external collaborations um, with the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, with the SBTI, um, and uh, with the Investor Climate International. On um, on the next slide, let's dig a bit deeper about uh, what's the what the benefits of such a program. So it's about getting invest getting the companies to report to CDP and getting the investor to collect data on TCFD aligned data points and also SPTI data points. Obviously, the expertise of CDP is also to guide the companies uh, via webinar documents and allow them to disclose uh, unique data points. Obviously, as I said, we are sitting on a very large database, so it allows to compare and benchmarking is something that we heard from private, uh, private equity firm is very important to understand and make sense of the data. Um, and that's what we, we try to empower investors, investors to do and then fill the gap with, uh, with estimations when necessary. Although, uh, obviously what, uh, what we, our motto is, uh, what you what you disclose, you can manage. So obviously, we want them to start calculating their emissions, and that's why um, that, that's why the sweep tool is also very interesting because it can also help uh, companies, you know, work on this baseline um, and, and, and report it. The next slide is more the focus on uh, or the perspective of the company. Why would they do that? Uh, obviously, it's it's generally important for companies to you know work on this baseline, but also identify targets learn about low, low carbon initiatives that are available in their sectors, identify gaps uh, compared to their peers, um, and then obviously report uh, report these, uh, these various actions, um, not only the negative impact, but how they are planning to, you know, to, to, to transition. Um, and what's important there is that as CDP is being used by large corporates, it's often uh, very relevant for the clients of these companies uh, to know that, um, that, that, uh, that, the, that the company is actually advancing and progressing on its, uh, on its journey. So, um, it can also not only fulfill the investor, uh, expectation, but also, uh, the client's expectation. And, um, and obviously it allows to track progress. Uh, we can pass through this slide. There's a questionnaire specifically for SMEs, and um, and this program is taking place mainly in uh, October. That's the disclosure uh, moment where companies actually disclose. So we are uh, first equipping investors to do this engagement, setting them up, and and then we collect data in October before uh, delivering uh, the data to investors in November, December. And this is an example of uh, a portfolio uh, analysis that can be uh, extracted uh, from such thing, as well as um, on the next slide, uh, a more detailed analysis, especially on risks. It's often important for companies to understand, okay, what are my, are my peers facing in terms of risk? Is it more transition risk, physical risk? If it's physical risk, uh, what are they? And that sometimes can help the company realize that um, if I talk about the climate uh, theme, that climate is a very material issue and that they may have undermined the risks and they need to actually stop transitioning. So this is the, the goal of the program. Um, thank you for, for sharing. Yeah, thanks, Jerome, for the presentation and uh, where we can see uh, all the, the momentum we have on CDP uh, globally uh, when you start in on, on larger corporates and the impact that we have now. Uh, we hope that uh, the CDP supply chain and CDP private market will have the same success uh, in, uh, in the next couple of years. Um, so when we say uh, presented sweep and CDP private market, you can see there is a, a common goal. How to align financial flows towards the low carbon economy, um, how to help investors to engage a dialogue with their portfolio company, how to make sure that the private markets will, uh, you know, fill the gap compared to what is already reported on the listed markets. So we kind of share the, the, the same thing saying that, yeah, we need to start to create some engagement uh, across the private market uh, uh, side. To do so, we've got a complementary approach. Uh, as uh, Jerome was saying, uh, there's a lot of initiatives that have been launched by CDP private market to help investors to uh, to, to start and uh, this discussion with their portfolio. But you can start with estimates. 
but with SWEEP, we hope that very quickly we can move away from estimates and start collecting activity data to have like a, a more granular and accurate carbon footprints because that's when you can, you know, actually uh, calculate a, a real baseline and start to assess where are the hotspots of your uh, finance emissions and for the portfolio company to understand, you know, uh, the impact of their activity and they can start looking at how to reduce, you know, what's the action levers I can put in place, what's the specificity of my uh, industry and my sector, how do I compare with my peers? I think, as you were saying, Jerome, it's very interesting to have this benchmarking because you don't really know when you start what is a ton of CO2 and if it's good or not in terms of intensity. So it's good to have this understanding of where do I, uh, you know, I see myself in this big picture and how I can reduce uh, to uh, to be more resilient in the future. So that's the global picture, a common goal, a complementary approach. And when you've got a more accurate carbon footprint and more accurate data, of course, you will have a, a better reporting on CDP to make sure that, you know, uh, investors can have a, a better analysis uh, when they invest in this company. So all together, let's take some action, uh, some action collaboratively. Hein? We are part of this ecosystem. We all want to uh, to have an impact and positive impact on the planet and uh, to, to be uh, to be forever companies. And uh, we need to adapt. And to adapt, we need to understand where we stand and how to uh, to proceed. So clearly, I think uh, it's uh, it's uh, some two good initiatives, of course, and uh, we are very happy uh, to to take some questions uh, now. I don't know, Raphael, if you want to to say uh, a few words uh, before uh, moving to the Q and A. Um, no, you both covered it all. Um, thanks so much. So I think we just jump right into the questions. We received a few. Um, the first one is 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 for you, Marianne. Um, we'll start off light. Um, you had great slides with Spider-Man on it. So who's your favorite Spider-Man? Is it Tom Holland, Andrew Garfield, or Tobey Maguire? <laughs> it's going to be Tom. <laughs> Tough. Okay. No preference. Big... Too bad. No I would have you said... Sorry, which one? No, no, it's good. No, no but it's... I think Spider-Man is quite flexible, and we need to be flexible when we, we talk about climate change anyway. Fair enough. I was hoping you'd say Andrew Garfield because everybody always says I look like Andrew Garfield, but you, you're staying neutral. Uh, which is I'm cool. sorry, I missed that one. <laughs> okay, let's let's get real. Um, so, Cheryl, maybe I'll pass this first question on to you. Um, somebody asked, "How does the regulation address portfolio companies today, specifically?" Um, I don't know if you, know, you can you can shed some light. Yeah, uh, no, it's a great question. It depends on the region, obviously. Uh, it depends on, on uh, where the company is based. And that's the problem. Uh, and that's why uh, CDP is, uh, is doing this work as well of trying to gather the data in a standardized and, and in a uniform way, because in a comparable way, it's difficult to get data from different regions that are, that are comparable. So, uh, what we can see in Europe, obviously, is that, uh, some, some companies have to disclose and, and will have to disclose even more data points by a regulation that is called the CSRD, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. Um, so in Europe, I think um, things are, are, are going to be pretty challenging and for more and more companies. Um, and that's why companies that have started their journey already by, for example, reporting to CDP on various um, data points will be better prepared to face these regulations. Um, in other regions of the world, uh, we don't yet see, uh, obviously, uh, such a depth of, of uh, in terms of data points report like to, to be disclosed. Uh, and mandatory by regulation, but we see things coming. In, in the U.S., uh, the SEC is working on a on a, on a piece of legislation, um, and they publicly announced it. So um, uh, this is something to look for. And then many countries are making a TCFD aligned disclosure mandatory as well. Um, and this is a trend that we see more and more. So although um, data points uh, or particular data points may not be requested, the framework. Um, of, of the TCFD, of the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure, is becoming as well um, something that is expected by regulators. And so more and more companies have to report in line with this format. Yeah, and just to complete, because we know that uh, where we can see the regulation is coming to like a smaller and smaller company to make sure like 
you know, more people and especially SMEs will start reporting and calculating their impact. But even if the regulation is not targeted all of the companies so far, uh, we can see that's a great momentum. If you want to raise some money, like we, we will ask you for your ESG strategy of your capital footprint. If you want, want to answer an RFP and to be a supplier of a larger group, they will ask you to do the capital footprint. So even if, you know, uh, the CSRD will come into force in 2027 for the smaller company, but clearly there's already a, a huge demand from the market to better understand, you know, the famous uh, full value chain of, uh, of uh, carbon footprints and to do so they lo are looking to their suppliers they are looking to their investees and that will be the, the smaller end of the value chain but uh, clearly everyone will be more and more involved in uh, doing their carbon footprint great thanks for that um we've got a question from tom um marianne in particular you, you talked a lot about moving sort of from model to measured right benchmarking and then going to to activity data so is benchmarking really a relevant tool and might it be dangerous if not well documented? How are benchmarks defined? So two questions, is it dangerous and how is it defined? No, no, I agree. Like when you talk about estimations, of course you've got the average of a sector or subsector. So you can't make a lot of, you know, uh, very deep decisions about estimates because they will give you, you know, a worse estimates and, you know, a range of emissions. But that won't tell you if a company uh, is the business model of a company is way better than its uh, its, uh, its sector. What we do as Sweep is uh, we we calculate our sectoral benchmark based on the CDP uh, data sets, but it's documented, of course. And we have the PCAF score from one to five about the quality score, but we have added additional uh, granularity uh, on the platform to explain how the benchmark has been calculated, because again. Uh, the benchmark made more and more sense when uh, you have uh, the subsector, you know, what we've got the force, you know, granularity of the sector, uh, GIX4, NAS4, uh, CDP, uh, level 3, etc. To have like that makes more sense and it's more relevant for uh, analysis. And of course, if you have uh, 10 companies uh, or 10 data points within uh, a subsector or 100 data points uh, within a sector, you don't have the same quality of benchmark. So that's what we document that as well, to give as much information as possible for the investor to take a decision. So it's always the same, a lot of transparency. What we want to do is a full audit trail on the platform. Is the mission has been estimated based on benchmark, how the benchmark has been calculated, you know, uh, what's the granularity of the benchmark, and after you move to activity data, which data has been collected, which emission factor has been applied, you know, and that will give you the results. So we try to be a very transparent so that people can take the best decisions, investment decisions they can. I don't know, Jerome, if you want to ask us something about benchmark. But... No, you said it all. It's, I mean, it's true that, and, and to make the link with the previous question about regulation, as we said, some investors also have to, uh, have to uh, well, face regulation to be more transparent and have to report on their financed emissions. But you have gaps. So that's, um, that's, you know, the chicken and egg situation where, um, you don't know what's, uh, what you need to, uh, to do first. And there are some gaps that need to be filled with estimations. Um, so that's, that's something that needs to be done. But I think it's, um, it's great to be working with companies so that they can report this emission and get these emissions more and more precise, uh, uh, after, after time. And, I think most of the benchmark that, that uh, I mean, all the benchmark that we uh, mentioned today are based on that are reported by companies. So um, it's important indeed to understand and, and be very transparent how, the, how they are built. Cool, that makes sense. Um, I've got a follow on question um, that's sort of related, right? So, and I'll pass it on to whoever wants to respond first. Um, so how do you see um, those regulations evolve you know sort of short and midterm um particularly as you know, so a private markets regulations how do you see that that evolve uh, well we, we touched a, a little bit upon this earlier uh, as Mayan said so like there uh, the, the, we talked in depends on the countries of course um and uh, we mentioned that in Europe, for example, the CSRD will be applicable uh, to smaller firms, uh, but it's progressive um, time frame. So it's not the case today and it will happen in the next uh, four to five years. Um, 
I think that a uh, regulation will will have to step in eventually because it's it's important that um, that all companies can disclose on the impact uh, they have not only on climate but also on nature in general, and that uh, we can you know shift uh, shift the perception as well of of, of customers of of. Uh, of all society to understand what is the true impact of products that we buy. And um, there are some initiatives, some voluntary initiatives um, that are happening, but that's what we what we realize is that it's not enough, that it's not standardized and it's not comprehensible by the end client um, that is that wants to buy something of the of the shelf. Uh, so it's important that some regulation come come in play and not only for large companies but also for, for smaller ones. So I do think that um, the 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 future will tell but the the direction it's taking is more transparency on accurate metrics, accurate data points related to strategy. And um, and that will um, obviously push companies to be more active uh, and prevent them from uh, from greenwashing their 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 you know their goals and and really walk the talk. Yeah, I think there's like two more questions in the in the yeah, chat. Yeah, so two more questions. We've got three more minutes, so I'll, I'll follow. On. So Celine <laughs> um, shared really interesting experience. I'll try to summarize. Um, they um, have done tests with two portfolio companies and got very detailed data from them, but then realized that um, you know the MTI only really required them to have you know sort of a, you know a, a rough footprint, no capex, opex, and also no scope three for those SMEs, right? And so they were sort of aiming high and then realized that wasn't actually required. Um, and the question is, um, you know, are there other methodologies apart from the SBTI, you know, that they could use? Um, with their portfolio companies. Yeah, so SBTI is not the only uh, framework, you know, it's one of the framework to design trajectories. So you've got SBTI for different types of industries and not uh, all of them has been addressed. And especially for SMEs, uh, you know, it's sometimes even for services and techs because sometimes, uh, you know, in portfolio company, enfin, in private equity uh, portfolios, you can see that most of the... Um, of the sectors are not covered by a specific SBTI uh, trajectory. So how we work uh, uh, at SWIP is uh, we have SBTI, you know, on the platform by default, but of course we work with also a, a climate consulting firm who are using other scenarios like the NGFS scenario, uh, the EAI um, uh, for, for energy sectors, etc. because, you know, there's other methodologies uh, that exist on the market. We can also have very custom trajectory uh, if you work with uh, on infrastructure funds. Typically, uh, we are working uh, with some clients with uh, their their um, climate partner, and uh, we come up with uh, very interesting uh, things like uh, avoided emissions to uh, to calculate the positive impact. And the famous COP3, of course, is uh, is is also very important because it's uh, as you say, uh, eighty percent of uh, of the impact of your portfolio company. So. Yeah, other methodologies exist. Uh, they will be uh, adapted uh, more to uh, some asset classes and some other, like for real estate, you've got the, you know, uh, the, uh, the crème uh, strategy, etc. So there's like for each asset classes today, not everything is covered, but so there's some other methodology that is VTI on the market. And at Sweep, you know, we try to custom most of the things. So if you want, we have a lot of things on the shelf for the ones who don't have, uh, you know, uh, uh, additional uh, consulting support, but we can also have, you know, a custom uh, a questionnaire, custom emission factor, avoided emission, removed emission, calculated, uh, other trajectory, custom trajectory uh, to fit with the specific business model of your portfolio company. I don't know, Jérôme, because uh, CDP and SBTI are kind of very close. <laughs> yeah, I think, no, it's a great question because I think it's it's very important as well to remind that the, the, uh, the science-based target initiative is about assessing the targets by uh, uh, that that are uh, put in place or that are disclosed by uh, by a company. So it's really about assessing the degree of ambition of targets. And I think the, the question was related as well to, to CapEx and other data points that are assessing the feasibility or the credibility of the targets. 
And I think these are two different two different things, um, and it goes beyond the the current scope of the SBTI. So uh, the SBTI will ensure that the the emission reduction plan by the company are in line with a 1.5 degree scenario and are ambitious enough. But that doesn't tell you how the company will achieve that. And um, if you look at all the tools in the market, I. Uh, I will um, I will talk about one tool that is uh, open source in terms of methodology and that goes beyond target setting. It's called uh, the ACT initiative, ACT, uh, which is a partnership between uh, the, the French en energy agency ADEM and uh, CDP to create a, uh, an analysis of how companies are transitioning. And there are some interesting data points there. But it's a film, it's a moving field. Uh, the, the transition plan is something that is, uh, that is progressing, uh, that we see more and more also in the regulation, but that is a bit at the, at the forefront of what is being discussed today. Um, so CDP has published a couple of papers, uh, about what is a transition plan, what constitutes a good and ambitious transition plan. So I can, um, we can share some resources afterwards. But this is something that, uh, of course, will be very important. More, the more company with SBTI, the more we will scrutinize how these plans will allow them to achieve their targets. Great. I think that's a great place to close it. We, I, I can see there's a few more questions. Um, Fanny, Arun, more of you will get back to you asynchronous um, after the webinar. Um, we have to keep it moving. Um, yeah, I think summary on all this is, you know, move you know, gather the data, but also make sure you don't just account, you actually, you know, set your targets, you have your plan, and you manage the transition. And yeah, as um, Marianne said, right, I think data gathering is one part of it, automate it, simplify it, so you can focus on taking action. And as long as you document things transparently, right, and you can declare your assumptions, as new regulations come up, as you know, the SBTI might publish, um, new ways how you should account for your plan. Um, you know, you'll have the materials ready and you can respond to that. I think that's the that's the key message there as well. Um, sweet. I think we have one more slide to close things out. Click, please, which is a little plug for um, our event next month. It's called the Climate Compass. This is our flagship um, conference that we host as we and um, it's going to be on the 25th of May in Paris, but also online. And we're really going to hone in on it, what it means to build forever companies, right? As we mentioned in the intro, um, we believe that carbon can be a creative force you know, to build sustainable companies, to build companies that will be successful in this decarbonized future that we're headed towards. And so we will have you know, a lot of industry experts um, and, and corporate leaders on site that will discuss this topic with us. How can you, you know, grow um, as a business, but also decrease your planetary impact? You know, how can you motivate your team? How can you build, we call it a climate action dream team internally across different functions that um, you know, move you towards those goals? Um, and what are different processes you know, around collaboration, communication, and compliance um, to become this forever company? And as we said a few times now, this is all about collaboration, right? It doesn't happen, you know, just one department or just one company. We need to do it together. So we're really keen to meet up with as many companies and as many climate leaders as possible. So please join us in Paris next month. And you can sign up on sweet.net slash events. And yeah, thanks so much, um, everybody, for tuning in. Thanks for your interest. Thanks so much for caring about, about the future. And thank you, Sharon um, and Marianne, for all your insights. Get in touch with us if you have follow-on questions. We'd love to talk. That's it. That's it. Thank you very much.